In the late 1970s, electronic music as we know it today was beginning to emerge. Early hip hop and electro music was rarely heard outside New York and was yet to make it onto record. In Europe, bands like Kraftwerk were experimenting with revolutionary, futuristic electronic sounds, sounds that would prove hugely influential. Most people had never seen a computer, let alone used one. One machine was about to change everything, sparking a musical revolution and helping lay the foundations for modern electronic music. The sound that would kickstart a musical revolution across America, Europe, and around the world was born in Japan. During the late 70s, the Japanese electronics industry was experiencing a period of huge innovation. New advances in technology meant relatively cheap electronic instruments and basic computers were being manufactured. You know, the only thing I knew by that point was like the sort of uh, electro drums that are inside of like your grandmom's organ, you know, that the church organ, the little rhythm machine that uh, Sly and the Family Stone used to use back in 1971. I mean, you know, that's the very first futuristic look into the idea of drum machines. Um, but no one ever wanted to make that the primary sound. You only used that when you had no drummer. There were a few records here and there, say like, uh, Why Can't We Live Together by Timmy Thomas, that obviously was using some kind of those, I think they used to call them combo rhythm units because they were built in the organs so that somebody could just have like a little rhythm background while playing the organ or something like that. That was the classic, typical thing. Everybody wants to live together. Why can't we live together? It's quite common to use drum machines on records. That Timmy Thomas record was a massive record. Even, even uh, there's uh, like a drum machine track on Yellow Brick Road, an Elton John thing. Uh, you know, was, they were being used, uh, but they weren't kind of a common language. This story begins with one man, Ikutaro Kakahashi, or Mr. K. Born in Osaka in 1930, Mr. K studied mechanical engineering at high school before opening a watch repair shop at 16. Following a period of ill health, Mr. K decided to concentrate on creating electronic instruments, launching Ace Electronics, who made combo rhythm boxes for Hammond organs, before launching Roland in 1972. By 1978, Roland had built a global name for itself in the music industry and had even released the CR78, a rhythm machine with basic programmable features. Back in the sort of late 70s, there was a band I used to rehearse in the same place as. They had a drum machine, a Roland CR78. It was a band called Crispy Ambulance, and they were using it on records. Then, in 1980, Roland released a machine that would change everything. I think I heard about it in Japan, and I think it was from a band called The Plastics, a uh, new wave Japanese band, and they were real hip and they said oh tr808 so cool you know i remember somebody said hey you've got to check out this box it's called the 808 you can actually program it went somewhere in manhattan or whatever it was uh sam ash or something like that and the guy had a drum machine but it wasn't the 808 at first it was like some dr55 i remember going down to the music store on 48th street manny's music and then we saw the 808 it was like oh there it was, and the guy said, oh, this is, this is the new thing. You can, you can program this however you want. It's got red buttons and white buttons. It's got knobs. It's like, it looks like a computer, man. Gotta get an 808. Gotta get an 808. Credited to two Roland employees, Mr. Nakamura and Mr. Matsuoka, the 808 was created by Roland as a rhythm machine for backing tracks. Like its predecessors, it was aimed at musicians without a drummer who simply wanted to make demos. Initial reaction was mixed, not least because the 808 didn't sound like real drums. I think when I first heard it, I didn't realize what a cool sound it was. It sounded so much like what an 808 sounds like and not like anything else that I probably was looking for something that sounded more like drums, but it didn't sound like drums, it sounded like an 808. Because at the time, it was you know, competing with the Linden and the DMX, which actually, like I said, sounded like drummers. The reviewer said, the, yeah, the, the Maraca sound particularly so, sounds like a, a horde of marching ants. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's what's good about it. 
but the fact that it didn't sound like real drums would end up being the 808's attraction. It sounded otherworldly, futuristic. The low sonic boom of the kick, the tinny snare, cowbell, and odd sounding hand clap. These elements all combined to make it completely unique. What Mr. K and Roland could never have predicted was the 808 would be adopted and championed by a new breed of electronic musicians who would use the 808 as an instrument in its own right. House, electro, Miami bass, hip hop, R&B, trap, crunk, pop, rock, drum and bass. All of these genres and more have been touched by the 808, driven by its iconic sounds. Without it, music would sound completely different today. But to tell this story properly, we need to rewind slightly, back to a pre-808 New York City. The vibrant beats and break scene was being led by a group of DJs from the Bronx, inspired by legends like Cool DJ Herc and Cool DJ D. Block parties were popular and a place for DJs to experiment, isolating percussive breaks and popular songs. One of the key figures in this scene was DJ Africa Bambara, the South Star leader of the Zulu Nation. Back in the early days, he was playing a lot of different music, dealing with the soul and the funk that was happening at the time. Now, it was also into a group called Yellow Magic Orchestra um, from Japan, and a group from Germany that stuck a, a big chord in myself was Kraftwerk. So with the funk of James Brown, Sly and the Family Stone, Uncle George Parliament, Funkadelic Clinton, and also my, 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 my homeboy, Gary Newman, I decided to mash it up. Thus became the birth of the sound called the Electrofunk sound. In the late 70s, future Tommy Boy Records founder Tom Silverman was working on his magazine, Dance Music Report, when he heard about Bambada. I heard about this thing that was happening called the Breakbeat Room at Downstairs Records. And this was a record store that was down in, down below on the way to the subways on 6th Avenue and 43rd Street. And there was a line out the door uh, of kids, like 16 and 17 year old kids, black kids, waiting to get to the front so that they could buy these records. And it was like a phenomenon. I had never seen anything like it. I said, what is, what's going on? And what do these records have to do with each other? And the kids would say, these are the records that Africa Bambata plays. And so I asked the guy who was sort of running that part of the store, selling the records about how I could reach Bambada. And he gave me a phone number and I called Bambada and he told me, come up and hear me play. I'm playing at the Tea Connection on Thursday night or whatever it is. And I went up to, uh, to hear him spin. It was a disco, Tea Connection. It was on White Plains Road in the Bronx. There were some guys at the door and I said, I was here to see Bambada. And I think they looked at me like they'd never seen a white guy in the club ever. They wanted to know who was this black young man who was playing all these different sounds of music to a large black Latino audience. It was hearing about me and the different songs I was playing. And this is the time when um, we was just getting the birth of hip hop. I asked Bambada that night, I said, do you want to make a record? And he said, okay. He, and I never made a record before. And I didn't really know what that entailed, except from hanging out with other people in the business that were making records. So I said, all right, let's start working on it. Tommy Boy was born in 1981 out of Silverman's West 85th Street apartment and set about making records. Hip hop as we know it was being born. Silverman and Bambada got together to work on ideas, recording a demo for a record that would define modern day hip hop and dance music. We cut a demo for what would become Planet Rock and it had uh, three or four different songs that we wanted to incorporate in that Bambada was playing. We used uh, I Like It, from BT Express, we used a Rick James song, Kraftwerk, and we used uh, Babe Ruth, the Mexican. And we made this eight-track demo. I ended up having a cassette of it, and I played it for Arthur Baker, and he flipped out. He said, this is great. Let's do a full-out recording of it. So uh, I said, all right, cool, let's put this together. In an uptown Manhattan recording studio, Silverman, Bambada, Baker, John Roby, and Jay Burnett set about producing the track. One of Bambada's MC crews, the Soul Sonic Force, joined them in the studio that night. The original Soul Sonic Force was Mr. Biggs, Pow Wow, Glow, Jazzy J. We was trying to do that whole family of funk or family of hip hop, like James Brown when he had the family of soul, or George Parliament, Funkadelli had in Parliament. It could be five or six on the stage, or sometimes we might have 
20 on the microphone. This gentleman here, first Soul Sonic Force member. My name is Mr. Big, Soul Sonic Force. Peace to the world. Africa Bambada's first MC. Released on Tommy Boy Records in 1982, Planet Rock was the result of a perfect fusion of people from diverse racial, social, and musical backgrounds. A melting pot of musical genres, attitudes, style, mentality, and beneath it all, a visionary use of a drum machine, the 808. Definitely a serious sound and gave that extra funk and grunt to the record. Because if you hear the craft where they was funky, but then it had that 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 soulful bass bottom that was needed. That was definitely the first time I saw an 808, and it was also probably the first hands-on computer that that I that I used in music. We heard that them drums come out that 808. We was that like, was the end. Yo. What the there was hell? no bass like the 808. It would just hit you in the head like your whole body would yes. just shake. Oh, it was the key. It was the bottom. And if you listen to the rock, the way Arthur and John mixed it, they, they had to play with that 808 for a while to give it that boom, 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 you know? It was very fast. The record was 129 beats per minute. And in urban dance music at the time, 120 was speedy. The rappers definitely weren't into Planet Rock when we did it. They thought it was a weird beat. They thought it was too fast or too slow because it was sort of halftime. It was so different. It had us startled like, either this shit going to be a hit or we ain't going to rap no more. Globe was the guy who wrote the stuff. So basically, Globe had to take it back and come with phrasing and sort of do halftime stuff. Globe was the masterpiece. He, he came up with the blueprint things he could do with a rhyme it's just crazy we were so into what we had done we didn't know what the outcome was going to be we were just relieved that it was over and we knew that something was going on in that room you really can't predict a hit you can wish it to be a hit you can want it to be a hit you can construct it to be a hit but we knew <clears throat> gut feeling that we had done something nobody else could copy we weren't sure if it was going to be a hit or a stiff it was just an experiment it didn't sound like a hit because there was never a record before that sounded like that. I thought we had something really special. To me, it felt more like a Talking Heads record. I was like, wow, because the clavinets and all the different things. I was super excited by it, even without the rap. Sonic! <laughs> Planet Rock was fast becoming a worldwide musical phenomenon. Its distinct beats echoed throughout nightclubs and on the streets, inspiring the development of new musical genres, and in turn the producers and artists who would continue to innovate with the 808 sound. When we heard Planet Rock, it was like a great twist on Trans Europe Express because I loved the theme out of it. It was just like a fantastic new look at it, you know. It's kind of Kraftwerk go tribal. You'd never imagine Kraftwerk doing that, which was a br brilliant thing about it. I mean, it was great, but it was like a really clever twist. You heard keyboards, you heard bass lines, but what's this drum sound? It's like Kraftwerk, but it's, it's urban, it's funky, it's cool. It was new territory because no one had really used an 808 on a record, and it has this low end that you couldn't really hear. You wouldn't know it was there, and then it would just blow up the speaker. I said, they're using this drum machine, and it's a viable piece of equipment that can actually you can make records out of, and people are accepting it because people hit the floor and dance to it. I can remember very distinctly the first time I heard Planet Rock. I think I must have turned 18 and moved to Brighton and started going to this club called Sherry's on a Wednesday night in Brighton. Um, alternative dance. These kids came by, basically, with a boombox. And they also had the fresh BMXs. For me, it was really a revelation. It was like futuristic, but making me dance. It's something that was very techy. When we didn't know what techy was, we just knew it was electrifying. And we knew that there was something very us about it. We heard the music, but we're like, what is that music? And they were playing Planet Rock. And we were like, what is this? This is, and, and someone said, well, it's kind of sort of this American thing called electro or hip hop. Instantly, we all were like, 
we have to find that record. This is probably the moment where my brain like clicked and I was like, wow, electronic. And it rock was definitely one of those like eureka moments for me. Planet Rock started a new movement in music, a movement headed by the 808, and one that would mark the beginning of electronic music as we know it today. Following on from the huge success of Planet Rock, the 808 became a defining sound in New York clubs. New York at the time, man, you know, every record had to have an 808 in it in order for it to have any sort of success in the dance floor. It was at the end of New Wave, the beginning, you know, of this, which we used to call hip-hop. Now it's freestyle, and today it's electro. One of the first tracks to explode after Planet Rock was Hip Hop Bebop by Man Parish. I'm not a trained musician. I can't read or write music. I still can't. So I basically learned music by just experimenting. But I didn't want real drum sounds. I wanted to be Kraftwerk. You know, that was my influence. I could be a band and not... You know, not have to deal with band members, you know. This was a way of having a drummer without having a guy there. You know, the 808. Hip Hop Bebop was actually one of those experimental things that I did. I didn't have a record deal. It wasn't meant as anything but just a playing around with some rhythms. I wound up doing a soundtrack for a, uh, a, a porn movie. <laughs> and uh, the record label said, do you have any other tracks? And I said, well, I have this, this, and this. And they said, well, what, what's that? And I said, oh, something experimental I did. Let's see if we could develop this into something. And uh, John Roby came in, put some keyboards on. It, it was just basically an open, freeform piece of music. There was no verse, there was no chorus, there was no structure to it. We took about six, 10-inch, 12-inch, reel-to-reel mixes filled, 60 minutes each. The guys from the um, label stayed home one uh, weekend, did a bunch of coke and MDA, and edited everything together with razors, and Hip Hop Bebop came out. So when they played it for me, they said, well, this is going to be the single. And I said, you can't do this. I mean, you know, this is embarrassing. It's not a real piece of music. There's no verse. There's no chorus. You know, everybody's going to laugh at me. Back in those days, there was no DJ culture. There's no dub music. You can't put out music like this. It doesn't exist. Sure enough, they put it out. I hid under a bush. And later on, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is what it is. You know? There was a club here in New York called The Fun House. John Jelly ben Benitez was the DJ. We used to bring acetates for John to play, and if the crowd liked the music, they would bark, ooh, 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 ooh. So we said, hey, we need another track for this thing. Let's throw some dog barking, because I'm sure they'll only play it in this one little club, and they'll recognize the dog barks, you know? So we were kissing ass and trying to get our record played at the Fun House. <laughs> There wouldn't be a freestyle scene if it wasn't for like Planet Rock because that gave birth to like that whole scene of melody records, you know, R&B and, and pop records written on 808 drums. Those were R&B records with 808s. All right, that sounded amazing. And the 808 drum machine had to be prominent. It's like all the other keyboards in the background, all the other musical stuff, yeah, that's cool. But as long as those drums was, was prominent, this record's a smash. Play at Your Own Wrist was a record. When that came on, the party got crazy. That was kind of almost the first freestyle records. I mean, if you want to deem singing over Planet Rock, if you want to just use it in that, you know, layman's terms, that was Planet Patrol. Every time I heard that, way hell, way hell, way hell, it was, everybody would run to the floor. It was really, really influential. I had that sound like you hadn't heard before. You might have heard the beat before, and the beat a million times after, of course, as we know. But the sound of that record was definitely unique. It created a whole nother subgenre. One record with a beat and a, and a feeling creates a whole nother segment. Slowly rap pulled away from the, the Planet Rock sound, if you want to call it. Things started to get slower, and it freestyle took off. The drum sound of Let the Music Play, the ambient drum sound, 
specifically came from me describing to Ark Liggett and Rod Way, guys, can we have the beat of the record like this part? Listen to this part. It goes. Your own I said, do you hear that echo in the beat? Boom, 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 boom. Can we have that echo through the whole record? And they thought it was crazy, but it was because I was, every time I played that part, it was like, whoa, this is bad. And this is when the crowd's going nuts. And of course, you can't have all that decay throughout the whole record as a kick. What we ended up doing was doing that, but then gating it. That's how that sound came to birth. We started. When I heard that sound it back as, as a full song when I was driving home, I don't know why, I was just like, damn, this is, like, this is the most of my, I guess because it was my first song, you could have sang, you know, Cracker Jacks over it. I think the first freestyle rap that records that got me into obviously because I was coming from a hip hop background was Joyce Sims. Because that was like and Shannon. That was like my intro because it was cool. It was like, ooh, I can break dance to this or I can dance with a girl. You know, it was like that's kinda like it was like, oh, this is it's like serious R and B, you know. What is really, really significant about that moment in time is is that created an entirely different space sonically in music when the relationship between between the bass and the snare became something entirely different you know and i'm talking about the the, the sonic landscape of just those two elements for a lot of people it would have been their really their first sort of subliminal influence to latin sounds with all the, with all the percussion that, that came with, with, with those rhythms you know yeah that's why it was simply a revolution strafe was around that time for me and i remember when it came out um it was just one of those slower records kind of like a rap beat you know but it got played in the big clubs you know it's like it's weird because it's it's quite an anomaly that record it's like nothing sounds like it nothing has sound like it since super sparse and minimal but it does all the right little things you know what i mean it's just one of those classic classic dance records Y'all want this party started, right? That was kind of the last thing I, I laid on the track. And when I laid that on the track, the uh, principals uh, of the company thought I was crazy. They was like, get him out of the studio. I was supposed to be in there uh, doing a pre-mix of the track. And I said, no, I, mean, I got I to gotta throw this down on the track. This needs to be here. Party started, right? Y'all want this party started quickly, right? Set it off, I suggest y'all. Set it off, I suggest y'all. What made the 808 a better tool was that I was able to tweak and tune the toms and even adding the extra snap on the snare as well as widening the uh, um, decay on the kick drum made a difference and the uh, 808 boom is a, a big thing. That was one of the initial discrepancies I had with the um, initial mix of the record being released. It was great that Walter Gibbons mixed the record, but he had just come out of uh, retirement and he was a uh, uh, born again Christian at the time and he felt that bass was an instrument of the devil. Snare drum. Open hat. Just starting with this uh, intro pattern here. Just want to get the levels right and everything. It's one of the special things about this machine. I'm sure everybody's been talking about it. That that kick, uh, decay you get on the kick. Now the accent actually helps to bring more emphasis to certain parts of the uh, pattern. Put some snap on that snare hi-hat on it's gonna clip clip that track nicely
set it off. I suggest y'all set it off. Come on, let's set it off. Set it off on the left, y'all. Set it off on the right, y'all. Set it off. Come on, let's set it off. Set it off. Set it off. But the 808 didn't only feature on club hip hop and electro records. The 808 sound was quickly adopted by pop musicians. Some of music's biggest stars embraced it. Marvin Gaye used Motown's in-house band, The Funk Brothers, on most of his hits. But by 1981, he looked to cut ties with the record company, moving to Ostend in Belgium, where he wrote what would become his biggest selling song ever. So when you have family problems, drug problems, and tax problems, you come to Belgium. <laughs> Well, I was living in Belgium in the, in the 70s. I originally worked for a studio in London, and they opened a studio in Brussels. And I got a call from a guy saying that he was Marvin Gaye's manager. Can we meet you tomorrow? Yeah, sure. He liked the studio, and he said, well, can we start next week? Yeah, sure. Having broken ties with Motown, Gaye started writing in a more stripped-down style, based on an 808, a big departure from his previous sound. Marvin did tell me that it was going to be with drum machine and synthesizer. So the TR-808 and a Jupiter-8. He planned to do a lot himself and he wanted to have some control so he could spend time doing the recording without getting too many other guys to come in and play. When he came in the studio, the, the patterns, the basic patterns had been programmed and he had the tempos all written down and that you couldn't touch it. That was very important that nobody, especially the fine tuning of the tempo, don't touch it. That's fixed. So he just said, well, this is song number one. Okay, record it. And then you just sat there listening to it and then stop. And that was the song. And there was nothing else. It was just the pattern. It is quite a cold way of working, working with electronic instruments. And then everything happened when he put the vocal on down and it warmed the whole track up and it all made sense. You have these sexual lyrics and this electronic groove, and it kind of went, yeah, it works. It's kind of weird that uh, one of the biggest hits of his career, the only song that got him a Grammy, was probably one of the most coldest, frozen, instrumental songs of that period. This was one of the first records to really use this instrument as its own instrument, as a, a totally different sound. Let's make love tonight. The marriage of that R&B thing with the percolating groove underneath really works. I have to play rock. Marvin Gaye comes in and kicks ass with the very said sound and, and drum machine. We really couldn't believe it. It was like, yeah, he's using 808. How do you figure that out? Now I've listened to it on YouTube, I'm like, Duh. We heard that beat and it was like, wait a minute, Marvin Gaye got a funky beat like that? Like a rap beat in his record? Like we couldn't believe it. We heard like the tones of it. It was like, wait, who made that beat for him? Like, like we wanted to know who made the beat. Nearly two decades later, Belgian band Solwax acquired an 808 from a secondhand shop in Ghent. They were told it was the same one originally used to record sexual healing. They rang us to say, like, we've got an 808, and, and they sold it to us for 808 euros. They said to us, this one um, was used in, a, in an Ostend studio. It had been there for 20 years. He, the guy actually said it's probably the one that was used on Sexual Healing by Marvin Gaye. But we never believed it. So we took it back to the studio, and I remember when we plugged it in, one of the first presets that was in there, and we hit it, and I was like, no way. I was really confused. I thought, well, this doesn't sound like a normal drum drum track. It's just I thought it sounded like something you'd hear in a, in a restaurant. You know, the guy playing a little keyboard in the corner while you while you're having a pizza. I think something's going on with this machine, guys, because uh, it's not really doing what I want it to do. I'm trying to get it to, to be doing other stuff. Maybe the ghost of Marvin is is here right now saying, no, 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 that's not the way to do it. 
that's not what I want. Sexual healing was just the start of the 808's journey into pop. Legendary production team Jam and Lewis also decided to make it the defining sound on their work with the SOS band. Well, I think we incorporated the 808 into a sound specifically for particular artists. So when we did the SOS songs, we did, you know, Just Be Good To Me. I don't even know whether we even cared at the time that what kind of drum machine it was, because we recorded those tracks in Atlanta, and they just said, oh, well, we got an 808. We're like, okay, fine, plug it in and let's go. And those songs hit huge. The next record we did after that was Cheryl Lynn Encore, and we went back to like a DMX or a Lynn drum or something, because it was like, we didn't want that sound. We kind of thought that's more the SOS sound. So we don't want to really take that sound and use it everywhere. And the exception to that was a group we did called Change, because we went over to Italy to record that album. and. Once again, that's what was in the studio was an 808. <laughs> After that, we kind of reserved the sound just for SOS band. So whatever the 808 lends, it causes you to create a whole different underlying thing that you build on. It was a huge part, I think, in how we created, especially for the SOS band, because I totally identify with the SOS band and the 808. And if I hear another drum machine, it kind of doesn't sound like SOS to me. really lucky that you know fate had you know put an 808 in our session a couple of times uh which turned out to be really you know pivotal records for us and then we heard other records like phil collins with the 808 it was like wait a minute we're late we got to catch up like phil collins is rocking the 808 like we got we got to get into this now I use drum machines as, as a tool, you know, I mean, I, and, and for me, it, it opened up my world for writing. To me, you know, the way I write is I need an atmosphere. Atmospheres will tell you where to go next and suggest what you could do after this chord. And, and sometimes those, those 808s, you know, patterns uh, that you write would give you a great platform and, and something that not, not a lot has to happen, which is, which is why on my stuff, certainly, uh, there's a lot of space when there's a drum machine. I found very kind of stimulating, particularly the conga sounds and the bongo sounds and the kind of sounds, you know. You could do a lot with them. You could make them kind of kind of mellow, you know, with the desk and things, and you'd put a little bit of reverb on, and it would, they would go back, and there would be a panorama to whatever you were writing. You know, you could use them and know that you were going to replace this and this and this with real drums, but this and this and this could stay and then sort of sitting there for 10 minutes and the thing just carried on, you know, quite happily. You know, you try to get a drummer to play something simple for 10, 15 minutes, he won't do it. We get bored. We'll play... No, don't do that, you know. Just play... And drummers... They, they kind of get bored and they want to show that they can do more than that, so they do that. Whereas drum machine will just, as long as you turn it on and you turn it off, it will just play that forever. And so that was the beauty of it. I mean, the joke is that you can't pour beer over a drum machine because it will stop working, but you can pour beer over a drummer and he'll just keep going. Back in the clubs of New York, hip-hop culture was continuing to grow. I was a fan of hip-hop. 
and would go to, at that point, it was a club called The Grill on 2nd Avenue. And that was the only place, really, that had a regular hip-hop. I think it was Tuesday nights. Hearing the, the hip-hop records that I was hearing at the time didn't really reflect what was going on at the club. Really, just as a fan, I wanted to try to make something that sounded like what the experience was of hip-hop in a club. Being as a Treacherous 3 were my favorite group, met Modi. I asked him if, you know, we could make a record together. And he said, well, we're, you know, we're signed. I didn't know that there were labels or signing or what producers did. I really didn't know any, anything at all. I just wanted to make a good record with them. And I felt like I had an idea of what it would sound like and to make a good one. And he said, you might want to talk to uh, Special K because his brother is a good MC. So I talked to Special K, we became friends. Special K wrote the rhymes and he got T, his brother T La Rock, to perform the rhymes. Uh, I was working at the time, I worked for Leroy Pharmacy in Manhattan. And my brother said he had an opportunity to record a record, but the producer wanted only my brother, Special K, and Kumo D. He did not want LA Sunshine, he only wanted the two. Three weeks later, four weeks later, my brother came to me, knocked on my door, and said, listen, I want you to record a record with the person's name, whose name, by the way, was Rick Rubin. And um, I, I wasn't interested. I said, no, you know, I just want to do this on the side. I don't want to record a record. So my brother pushed me and pushed me and pushed me. I went downtown to meet Rick Rubin, and I remember we met at NYU. Rick played this beat for me and blew me away. And that was It's Yours. And he used this drum machine called a Roland 808. The only reason that was the drum machine on It's Yours was because it was the only drum machine we had. And uh, that was where the beat was programmed. It wasn't like we tried all the great machines and ended up with the 808 as our choice. It just worked out that way. I do remember that in our search for bass, I think we were in a 16-track studio and I think six of the tracks of the 16 track were all the kick drum. Taking a record that's already made with the help of the mix for use in the cross fade rhythm can be kept to a self choice pace depending on moment. I remember sitting there, just look staring at the 808, saying, "My God, all of this is coming out of that machine," and I remember being afraid to touch it. <laughs> but I wanted to. <laughs> it's yours. After I recorded It's Yours, I forgot about it. I went back to work the next day, and I turned the radio on. And I remember the radio personality. She says, the number one requested song of the day and hip-hop lovers, and I'm thinking, here we go, another Run DMC record. And I heard that opening. Damn. I grabbed Ken, the pharmacist, yanked him over. Before he can get this close, the lady says, brand new, number one requested song by TLA Rock. And I said, oh my gosh, she said my name wrong with my records on the radio. I put it on and I heard and I said, wow, this record sounds like one of the, the demos that, that we were making. To me, that was like the official version of hip hop as I knew it. Everything slowed down. And now all of a sudden, the groove was a little slower. You can hear more of the rap as opposed to the rap just, just kind of like flying over the beats. Fast forward, Danceteria, record release party, Beastie Boys. Uh, <laughs> uh, they were the undercard. For those that don't know, Danceteria was a big scene back then, but not really for hip hop. I'm thinking, oh my God, how are these people gonna react to me? I went out, the record came on. I'm talking about everyone, the entire club just erupted. And they were drowning me out, put it that way. <laughs> Once again, I have to come back to that drum machine. I had those speakers and dancer cheerio booming. Now, everything is great with this yours, but I have one major complaint. <laughs> this guy walks up to me, and I thought I had some kind of beef with this guy. I'm like, nah, I'm this gentle giant, this nice guy. What kind of beef could he have with me? And he goes, oh, man, if you, if you, if you wasn't such a superstar, man, me and you would have problems. Why? He says, man, your records blew out my speakers. I said, oh my God. He's, I said, are you serious? He says, man, I turned the bass up. My whole system just blew out. I said, well, 
I, in my mind, I'm like, yeah. But in front of him, I'm like, hey, man, <laughs> sorry about that, but that might be the best story I've heard <laughs> all year. <laughs> True story now. After the success of It's Yours, the kick drum and low bass of the 808 became key building blocks of early hip-hop. It's one of the defining sounds of hip-hop. From Planet Rock to, I mean, we used it on 99 Problems, you know, with Jay-Z. Rick Rubin was the king of the 808, but he put the rock in the 808. The album that he definitely utilized the 808 uh, in its finest moments to me was uh, Licensed to Ill by the Beastie Boys. The fact that he was able to get so many ideas out of the 808. Well, I think before well, we talk about what, what happened, really, before we talk about you know, the impact of the 808 and everything on the album, to get there, I'm going to just go in baby steps. I think but Adam, to give credit where his credit's due, procured our first 808. Right. We put out our song Cookie Puss, and it was a 12 inch with some other sort of dub versions of it and stuff on the B side. And we had come into some money as a band in regarding a lawsuit against a well-known airline company that used the song, part of it. As, without licensing. Without licensing it. And so I went to the used music store, Rogue Music, and I was going to buy, I had 250 bucks, and I was going to buy a Rickenbacker guitar like Paul Weller's, the exact guitar. And then there was a 808. And I'd heard about it, and I'd heard like, oh, that's the Planet Rock thing, or something like that. Like, I'd heard that, and I wanted a drum machine, and I was like, well, fuck it, I'll just buy this one. So instead of the guitar, I bought the drum machine. It ended up at, a, at the studio. We all recorded at the studio called Chung King. And so, like, my 808 is on our album, on the first couple of LL Cool J albums, on Run DMC, a couple of their albums. And so it was kind of like, for whatever reason, became the Chung King 808 for a while. Now, here's a little story I got to tell about three bad brothers you know so well. It started way back in history with that rap and me. My team. I mean, to take an 808 and reverse it on Paul Revere, how do you even think about that? Play the tape backwards and then they rap to that, which is, who thinks of that? Basically, Mike was saying that we would push Rick to like push the bass and the kick. It was really Adam Yauch that was really the techno whiz. And so he was very into production and how to get certain sounds. So he was really into like that sort of thing. The three of us were going to meet, run in DMC and write a song and record a song. And we didn't really have an idea. We were just going to meet at some random studio on 20-something Street. And so we get there, and there's an 808 there. I don't know whose it was. Maybe it was theirs. Maybe it was ours. I don't know. But Yauk was like, oh, we should record it backwards. Tell me if I'm saying this wrong. But Yauk was like, because Jimi Hendrix, I had heard or read somewhere that he used to do a lot of stuff backwards. Like he'd turn the tape over, record guitar solo, and then turn it back over, and the shit would be backwards. Yeah, I got a license to kill. I think you know what time it is. It's time to get ill. Yeah. Now what do we have here? And I owe in his beer. I run this lady you understand I'm in myself. So he programmed just like the simplest 808 pattern, but recorded it on a tape. Flip it, over. Then flipped the tape over. Flipped the tape over, so it was recording it backwards and played it back, so it would... It... Yak recorded the, the, the beat, you know, recorded it onto the tape, but then flipped the tape over. So then the tape's... Uh, he flipped the tape over and recorded it. No. Yeah, he flipped the tape over, recorded it. Uh, other way. See, it's like 40 it, it years later, and I still don't know how it With happened. the record head on... Anyway, this is not for the... No, it Not is. This the is the, you're telling the story. Tell no, them how it actually happened. I don't remember. With, with the recording head on, it only goes in one direction. But so you record it. Um, you record it forward, but then you flip the tape. So when it's playing back, it's backwards. But everything else you're recording on it is recording forward. Which is what we did. Okay. Does that make sense or doesn't really not really make no. any sense? And you, the way you just looked at me, it seemed like you were really confused when you said it. <laughs> not a good sell, huh? <laughs> um, all right, I didn't but sell But it comes out backwards well. is the whole thing. So what I'm saying is... fucking backwards. What I'm saying is, as you can see, in terms of the technological and production level of our band, it went Adam and then Mike and then myself was <laughs> yeah. kind of dead last. And let's do fly. Hands went up and people hit the floor. He wasted two kids. Well, now we're hearing the, the 808 beat backwards, where it's zoom, 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 zoom. and uh, run, he comes 
run in like, yo, just yelling, like jumping up and down, like this, this is the record, this is the record. But it really was amazing. It was just like one of those moments where just like inspired by one thing that had nothing to do with the 808 record, right? Like Jimi Hendrix records or whatever. And yeah, having this like split second, like innovation. Nobody could have ever imagined it'd be like this backwards, stripped down drum machine loop vibrating uh, windows around the world. We just tried to find ways to amp it up, to be as over the top as possible, overloading things to just take them to a, to an extreme place. Our intention really was to like shatter windows. We wanted to take it to a place where it was really like uh, like abusive kind of. Rick Rubin had a period in 1985 where he did uh, Together Forever for Run DMC, uh, Slow and Low for the Beastie Boys, and at the same time, Russell Simmons got a Columbia deal, $2 million Columbia deal, put out Crush Groove, and then boom, LL Cool J's the, the, the poster boy, and suddenly Rock the Bells is on the top 40 charts with full bass. Planet Rock introduced the 808 to hip hop music. From there, Rick Rubin figured out that you could get bass out of it by tuning it to full decay. The rumor is Dr. Dre of Original Concept showed him how to even get a fuller tone out of it. To me, the most incredible use of it was Dr. Dre from the East Coast. He created a record called uh, Knowledge Me, one of the early Def Jam records that nobody knows under the name of Original Concept. He took the 808 and did something to it that, that made it huge. I remember uh, Original Concept, and they started really misusing the boom kick drum. I just went. Mm. You know what I'm saying, man? Where you go next? I went to see Rusty J, man. The Rusty view, J with man. the airline on the radio. Yo, man, man Rusty J be fresh. You know what I'm saying? Cause yo, he had a lot of girls. That record, I I would go in and sample that, and that was my 808 for the rest of the records. Bring the noise, rebel without a pause. <laughs> And the list goes on, you know, party for your right to fight, you know, Terra Dome. Anything that I could possibly put had to have that. When you listen to Ruben's stuff or you listen to the stuff that LL was making or you listen to the Shockley or Eric Sadler or Bomb Squad um, productions, it was just larger than life. I mean, it literally felt like it had come from, from, from Mars or something. And uh, a, a lot of the intrigue was just trying to work out what the composite of that sound was. I was listening to uh, a Molly Mall record, and he sampled the the kick and the snare from records, all right? But then he also added a sustain kick on the on the one. So you get this kind of like boom. I'm like sitting there going like, yo, I want to sample that. So I sampled that a million different ways. And from that point on, that particular sound was in every. It was. It's. It's kind of like milk or or adding water to, to. It's like. It's like you cannot make a record without having that 808 sound. It's just. It's just not. It's just not hip hop. It's not authentic. I am taking no prisoners, taking no shorts, breaking with the metal of a couple of forts. While I'm hearing that boom, supplement the mix, calling Russian like the bears in the '46. Who fools I don't know, but they're part of the pack. In the plan against the man. Bum rush attack For the suckers at the door If you're up and around For the suckers at the door Gonna knock you right down Yo Yo Come on man go, Let's go back to uh, Yo bum rush the show Riot starter My Uzi weighs a ton It didn't matter It's like whatever record I was making It's like it wasn't complete Unless yo we gotta put the 808 in this shit man <laughs> Bang And then now the record's finished Alright But I didn't care if it was a ballad It was like okay I'm doing an R&B ballad Okay it's not complete Put the 808 in it It's hot now While hip-hop and electro dominated in New York, a new sound was developing further south, a sound fueled by the 808 kick drum. In the 80s uh, and part of the 90s, the 808 really found a home and an identity in Miami. You know, the whole Miami bass sound. It really comes from Planet Rock, to be honest. I mean, the 808, I, I wonder if Planet Rock was done on a different drum machine if Miami bass would sound different. In New York, it was like TKA, Lisa Lisa and all these people, so nobody out of Miami was doing it. So 
I go, you know what? Let me try to do it. The first record I did was uh, Fix It In The Mix. That went platinum. <laughs> The problem I had was the first record I did went platinum and go, he's lucky. Because if it wasn't from New York, it can't be real. Second one platinum. He's still lucky. Third one. Gotta kind of watch this guy. He might. <laughs> and then by like four or five, I was accepted. I was one of the first people that I know about put bass boom on record. And it just sound awesome. So I was just coming out of being a DJ. So I go, you know what? I reflected back to my crowd. I go, they would love this. Problem was, when I went to the mastering lab, they go, you can't do that. I go, what do you mean? You can't put that boom on a record. I go, listen, I'm paying you. Put it on. <laughs> and I took it from the mastering lab to the radio station, and it went crazy. In Miami, all of a sudden, it was this very local music. It was very Southern. Kind of talked about the neighborhoods there. You know, there was probably six to eight different acts that were just all 808, 808, 808. You couldn't use no other drum machine for a Miami-based style of music. It was a must. It spawned this huge scene down in Florida where it no longer was just in the skating rink. Now it was making its way out into the masses and into the high school dances and uh, into the clubs. And my first experience in Italy came when we were running a small studio up in Hollywood. We used to call it the box. In those days, you know, Luther Campbell, Luke Skywalker was running the place with a song called Third D. So Mr. Mix, Mr. Hobbs, who is the main guy who was the beat producer at that time, he would come to the studio and me and my other partner was the engineers there. My blueprint was taking elements of the Planet Rock record you know, using that as the tempo guide and then actually taking hot records that was at the same beat per minute speed and mixing those in to the um, 808 drum machine and then putting comedy stabs of wild and crazy stuff being said. You know, that was my um, gumbo pot of making what they end up calling Miami bass. Back in the days, the iPhone wasn't there. We could film on Mr. Mix making his loop on two tracks at a time. You know what I mean? And then he would be using the SP-1200 for his music sampling, chopping up, and you'd leave him there like about, say, 1 o'clock in the day, by about 6.30, come back. What you would hear would be crazy. He would, like, have the meters. I pulled the damn needle off the shit. All right, let's do it. I would just tinker around. When I actually got one, I actually take the 808 drum machine in the parties with me so you know you're playing a popular record, you know what I mean? And then you turn the machine on. It's a record that nobody knows. Or at least they think it's a record, but they don't realize it's a drum machine that's up there playing, you know what I mean? So, you know, then, you know, then you're able to solo your scratches and all of that and do your little thing to it. That's what we would do, you know, live, and people would just think that, man, what is he doing up there? He's ruining something, or he's making something, he's creating something. It was all about the bass. It was all about the bass. To me, the whole world was about the bass. So many kinds, where can we start? We like them dumb, and we like them smart. I like the ones with the pretty eyes. Well, I like all kinds of guys. Stop. What happened? How about the ones we especially like? Which ones? You know, the ones with the cars that go. I hear you. Hit it. In Hollis, rap music was big, but it was kind of more like Run DMC and I Love Cool J. You were fly when you had gold chains and Adidas. In Miami, you would fly if your speaker system rattled the windows. If you annoyed the neighbors. It was me and the posse with Bunny D. We were cruising in the Jags or the Lamborghinis When lo and behold, there appeared a mirage He was hooking up a car in his daddy's garage It was we full on culture shock The music was different, they talked with a funny accent They wore funny clothes, but, you know, 
It kind of rocked my world. I just adapted. You be driving any time in Miami back in those days, and a car would pass you, and you lit, your car would literally freeze in the road because that that 808 would just, you know what I mean? Boom, boom. Boom, boom. You know, all bass music. And people like, you know, they were building systems bigger than any system I'd ever seen in the back of a car. Inspiration came from these two old Jewish dudes in the studio. Um, we recorded the whole album and they kept pushing, write a song about the cars. You guys are always cruising around with these big systems. Write about that. And we're like, don't nobody want to hear about that. So we kind of postponed writing it and then at the very last minute we needed an extra track. And we're like, oh, it'll be a B-side. I wrote it in like 15 minutes, the lyrics and everything, because we thought it was kind of silly. And then, yeah, and then it charted. We had other songs that we thought were going to be the smashes, but we loved it. You know, it was really playful. It kind of like spoke to our generation and our culture, at least in Miami. That's what we did. We cruised around and we especially liked the guys with the cars that went boom. <laughs> we coming from the reggae experience, we know what the deep bass is, but this is almost like a tone now. This is not like the bass guitar is, is that resonance of that low end. Dynamics 2 actually did a record, I want to say it was in 87, called Give the DJ a Break, and they were one of the first groups to tune the 808 drum. We just had an idea to take the 808 and make it the bass line for the song. So we took the 808, um, and married it with a 909 and an emulator and brought it into an SB1200 and played it multi-tones. As soon as that happened, you know, we get we sort of got credit for having being the first record to do that down here, and it was a huge record. It went gold for us. Eric Griffin was the programmer on that song, and he took the 808 kick drum in its full decay and tuned it. But he did something to it that gave it a unique sound. I don't know, I don't know exactly what he did. I never got a chance to find that out. Please stay tuned. Please, please stay tuned. But I, I was given that sound by Dave Noller, and I actually have that sound there. So it's got the punch and the decay, but it's got almost like a, you know, sine wave or triangle wave. And that just had everyone's head spinning. Whoa, how'd they do that, you know? And that's where the SP-1200 drum machine came in, which had enabled us to tune the sounds. You know, even the snare drums, we would, we would be able to take the original snare and we did things like, you know? So it just, it just hot-rotted the, the 808. In Italy, producer Tony Carrasco was introduced to the 808 and would produce a seminal record that influenced everyone from New Water to the Pet Shop Boys. One of my friends who has, he had this whole sound gear, all this analog stuff. He brought it in and said, I think you would like this drum machine. So he gave it to me, he showed me a couple of step programming that he was doing on this drum machine. I said, wow, I gotta try to do something on this you know, drum machine, do sort of a, a record on it. Carrasco used the 808 on a couple of recordings before he began working with Mario Boncaldo on what would become Klein and MBO. Mario Boncaldo came to me with this demo, and I said, wow, I like that. I said, let's try to produce that. And the idea was something very human league, you know. big record because it's just it's just one of those things you feel when the, the chemistry is right you know when we finished the mix i took it back to my club i was playing the club in long 
people in the dance just responded tremendously. I said, wow, this is going to be big. Two months later, some fashion model came to uh, the club. And he says, this record, they're playing this record in New York. I says, really? He goes, yeah, it's just blowing up. Thanks to Jellybean, of course. <laughs> My best friend, you know. Dirty Talk um, was really interesting because it used the 808, but it also had this, like, Italian thing to it. Tony Carrasco who was the writer and the artist and producer of it, was a New York DJ for a long time and moved to Italy. So he sort of fused um, like sort of the Italian disco thing, but it also kept sort of the underground thing that was happening in New York. It was a, a very, very big record. They really rocked the percussion and the hi-hats. So now you found another element of the 808 that was really interesting. It wasn't all about just the kick and the snare no more. Now you had the doo 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 and you had all that type of stuff making you dance. That was one thing about the sound of 808. It had the ultimate dance feel to it. Klein and B.O. wasn't even a record. It was like, okay, it was like, what do they say? Nobody knows the lyrics. Nobody knows the melody. Nobody knows shit. All anything that anybody knows is like, Yo, that beat's crazy. Over in Chicago during the mid-80s, early house producers such as Chippy and Jesse Saunders were working with the 808, creating influential tracks that would help build the foundations for house music as we know it today. These things inside my soul, they make me lose control, it goes on and on. A lot of dance music was quite uh, familiar stuff based on R&B. House music and techno music, I mean, it's, it's all about having this one bar looping endlessly and doing variations on that. And for me, that's like the definition of house. I think all the early house producers and stuff perfected it in a more functional, rhythmic, just purely rhythmic sense. And it's forever going to be associated with that sound. The early days of house and techno music were beginning in the Midwest cities of Chicago and Detroit. But what could be considered one of the first early experimentations with acid house sounds actually came from India. Bollywood session musician Charanjit Singh created an unusual futuristic blend of 808 beats on his album 10 Ragas to a Disco Beat. So far ahead of its time, when released in 1982, it predated the first acid house records to emerge from Chicago by at least two years. I think every dude in Chicago did. You know, and I would watch like Marshall and DJ Pierre, Mike Hitmel Wilson, uh, even Bad Boy Bill, he was like one of these cats. Was on. So I would like sit there and watch them. Like I was a keyboard player. Like I was not trying to even come near a machine that produced beats. I just wanted to play keyboards. Chicago, 84, 83, 85, maybe to 89 when BMX GC went out there. That was that was our shit. Right there. For us electronic motherfuckers, the 808 was our savior. What I loved about all those records at that moment in the in, in the mid-80s was their simplicity and, and, and the rhythm. The Chicago and the Detroit stuff was coming from, I guess, from a European perspective. They, they were taking on European influences and bringing that into their music. There was a lot of people just trying to bite around that sound. Particularly Chicago, there was a lot of producers in Chicago that were just sending me, like, you know, at the time, letters, because we have now emails today. They were a very big fan of that sound. And they were saying that it sort of influenced the whole Chicago, whole sound, Detroit sound and all that. In Detroit, an 808-driven electro track was created by Juan Atkins and Richard Davis as the group Cybertron. Released in 1983, Clear can be considered part of the early evolution of techno music.
It's a bit like one of those things where you start, one day you realize that almost all the music you loved did have an 808 in it. Something like uh, Derek May, uh, Rhythm is Rhythm, Icon, I think it's like one of the biggest, biggest records for me, like most influential records for me. That's all 808. Turning the 808 on reminded me of the, the Juan Atkins records and also took me back to the first records that really, I guess, got me into electronic music. Probably my m most beautiful moment with, with an 808 was going back at 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning after listening to Derek May play in Detroit and turning on my 808 and creating a whole song out of it, trying to make an intense uh, rhythmic piece out of one machine. And in actual fact, it became one of my biggest songs because that was uh, Plastic Man Spastic, which is pure 808. In the late 80s, an acid house explosion was taking place in the UK, influenced by the music pioneered in Chicago. I think it's been going back and forth in a very interesting way. You know, um, house music was born in, in Chicago, in New York, and London, and I mean, the UK in general, they really have that thing of turning a street phenomenon into uh, adding a cool factor to it so that it becomes um, more like a trend. Me and you were going down the Hacienda quite a lot. Yeah. Um, and hearing the beginnings of the acid thing there. You know, it was natural for us to start dabbling with a bit of acid house. school sound at the time for me because I'd, I'd kind of gone through like the old electro thing but I was used to it and it was a nice sound. The acid thing was really intense at the time there was a sort of focus on it wasn't there where it felt like it was in the air and it was exciting therefore when we first made uh, New Build that first album it was about an intensity. What you can do with the 808s and those kind of machines is block them off at sevens and nines mm. and things. Put them against each other and you start getting these really interesting polyrhythms that are really exciting. And we weren't particularly focusing on making a dance record, making a club record. It was just making it as alien as possible and pushing into that alien territory. That's when I got really excited about that kind of music. Yeah, you know? same here, actually. Yeah. It was a way of kind of pushing and, like, a, an experiment in, like... Yeah. In some ways, we're trying to emulate the American thing, but not really, because we're trying to oh, mess with that formula, you know, <laughs> sort of take those sounds yeah. that are familiar yeah. and then push it out as far as you could, you know? By the early 90s, a number of musical genres began to split off. Producers were experimenting with breakbeat sounds and heavy bass. Jungle and drum and bass were born, and the 808 would play a key role in their development. 808 was the soundtrack to my generation, and hearing it and thinking, we can, we can really fuck with it, wouldn't it be great to turn a whole bunch of people into, onto it? The, the tunes for me that took up the mantle of it within drum, my own music, within drum and bass music, was Foul Play, Satin Storm, Dog Scott, myself, you know, <sighs> Warehouse, you know, Too Bad Mice. I beat the records especially, they hacked into it like you wouldn't believe. Mickey Finn, I think, was the first thing I heard, which was just, uh, I think it was about six o'clock in the morning, Carson Morton, and it was frightening. It was kind of the best day of my life and the end, end of the world had come at the same time. And I found that just, you know, I found, I found Mickey Finn's production specifically, and then Peche's and, and uh, people like that, Bookums and stuff like that. I found that mind blowing. as far as drum and bass music was concerned from the first note where it was Bookham on Horizons rolling it or me dropping it on one bar on Terminator or Satin Storm or Here Comes the Drums or any of those or your sound any of those classic tunes once you commit to the 808 you're committed to it Gladly for us technology came along again a decade later where we could bend the 808 where we could we can harness this power <laughs> you know what I mean people could tune their kick drums so the kick drum could play the bass at the same time and that was something else that when I first put headphones on I was like, hang on a minute, 
you know, there was drums and there was bass, but now the two were sort of fused. So the feel was not just complex and rhythmical, but it was also tonal. For me, the first idea of bending it was Hit Factory, KRS-One. I always wanted to do a track with Chris, and, and I always felt that a homage thing was using 808, you know, on the, on the VIP especially of, of KRS-One. For me, was, you know, that's like, I've met my heroes, I might as well go and head, get hit by a match truck now. with it is how do you cut it? How do you affect it and cut it on a lathe? Because I'd have people like Stuart and Masterpiece going, well, Leon at Music Power, why, the thing just jump out, man, it blow the head, it can't, it just blow the head up, man. Things got too much beers, man, on the beers, man, too much beers, this and beers, that. And it was true, because we were, like, cranking it, and it was just, you know, you see the cutting arm go across, and it would just go, <laughs> it was like, that's the bass. So we'd have to, you know, go back and tone it down, or, you know, cut it in mono. And then we started to try and echo it and reverb it where it would just be shuddering around. And, and you see the speaker going. That's the 808, lads. That's the 808. It wasn't until we had spectrum analyzers where you could see, uh, ah, there's your problem. <laughs> you know, got all this sound going like that. And then this is one peak. <laughs> That's the bass line. Just out the roof. There's nothing else. It's gone. Throughout its life, the 808 has continued to inspire and influence musicians, lending its beats to countless iconic recordings. Throughout the 90s, 2000s, and into the present day, the 808 sounds continue to be as relevant as ever. Without an 808, yeah, you couldn't have, you know, what we call bass music. You couldn't have what I did, crop music. You couldn't have the Memphis movement. You couldn't have... New Orleans bounce music. It's the foundation of those tracks. Those tracks won't sound the same without that boom. It's got to have that drop. I think the 808 stayed really alive in the South for, for a long time as it became probably dormant on the rest of the world. And then Southern rap just rose. A former Miami bass producer out of New Orleans, Manny Fresh, who was the in-house producer for Cash Money Records and working beneath the radar, he kept the New Orleans bounce sound alive, which is heavily related to Miami Bass. And when Master P became a powerful independent record label owner and Universal Records went down to New Orleans to find out who else was, was working down there, they found Cash Money, they found Manny Fresh, and that's why the 808 became today's uh, pop music, today's hip hop music, because Bounce became, or influenced, uh, Lil Jon with the whole Atlanta crunk scene and TBT Records got on board and Atlantic Records got on board with Trick Daddy and now we have today's top 40 music. I think my biggest record of my life ever with an 808 is Yeah by Usher. biggest record of his career. The album went on to sell 10 million records, and that was the single that blew that album up. It was an R&B singer singing over an 808 and a, really a dance sample. Like, nobody had really kind of bridged those worlds together before me, and that, that's also why I say myself as an 808 guy, because, I mean, I really had the 808 booming in that track. What really made that song so big, it, it was that it appealed to people in the hood, ghetto motherfuckers, to pop motherfuckers. And that's a wide variety and range of people to appeal to, to appeal to super pop and super hood, you know, is amazing. There's a whole school of, of rap beats currently that use the 808 kick pretty much exclusively. And the thing that's amazing is, is that 
there's still new patterns being created with it. The type of like really stuttery and pitched snare and hi-hat patterns that you hear in this current era of like Lex Luger, Drummer Boy, kind of uh, post Manny Fresh, you know, Southern hip hop production. That's a whole other kind of evolution. One really defining 808 thing for me, and I was actually talking this uh, yesterday with uh, Tiga, and we started talking about uh, how the 808 actually changed both of our lives quite a bit. I was a DJ and I owned a nightclub and a record store. I was doing well for myself in Montreal and Canada. Anyway, I had obviously lots of dreams and stuff and it all hinged on production and I was a bit lazy and a bit, I don't know. And then one day my friend Yori Halkonen, he came to Montreal, I brought him to Montreal for a New Year's Eve party and we had like a day off or something the next day. We had nothing to do. So uh, Tiga had an 808. I had a Juno and we rented an MPC. Miss Kitten and the Hacker had just done this uh, EP. They had done a couple of cover versions. I think they had like uh, Sweet Dreams, Miss Kitten re-singing it and uh, kind of like dirty electro version. And we thought like, oh, we want to do something like this. We started screwing around and we made this Sunglasses at Night, this track. Just like in an uh, hour and a half. Which is almost entirely 808, no effects chain, nothing. It was just like raw 808 to dad. That became like uh, one of the biggest club records of that year and kind of started Tiga's career. The track became super successful and completely launched me. I mean, I don't think I'd be here if it wasn't for that. That was the first record that Tiga was ever part of in producing and, and making of. So that kind of started Tiga's whole career. I think the record sold like 250,000 copies. And it was beyond raw, I mean, beyond ghetto. It was exactly punk rock or exactly how I imagined the old Chicago guys making their tracks. That kind of changed a lot of things for us. So, so the 808 actually, has been a big influence in my career. I love the 808. For me, it changed my life. A lot of the use of the 808 is down to people who are open to new technology using the thing. Producers, it's like, the thing that I really like about Rick and obviously about Bambata and certain people that take things and use them in a different way is that they have open mind, open minds towards different musics. And so you hear Bambata and he's like, oh, I want to make a Kraftwerk record as opposed to I want to make these rap records that are fucking awesome, but they're like, you know, funk records, R&B tracks that are awesome, but it's like, I want to make this other thing. Rick Rubin's like, I want to make a Led Zeppelin rap song. And Alec Empire, that's like, I want to make a fucking Bad Brains dance 808 track like there's people that make some weird shit that takes this thing into a whole different direction that makes this thing special have you ever heard this track i did called kick drum you hear that 808 blasting it i'm doing shit with the 808 that's never been done fuck it let's reference that shit i'm running that shit through fucking all kinds of filters and chaos and shit i think i have the best 808 track of the last 10 years. The whole track is an 808. It's like my big fat kick drum makes me go boom boom. It's like boom boom. Y'all feel that shit? the massive void in the sound spectrum that wasn't there. Since its arrival, it just established itself as like this pertinent frequency people may have not 
may not have known that that frequency mattered so much to them with music. But once the 808 started to occupy that space, it became like something that you missed if you didn't have. It's like Semsex, right? It's like, just carefully put it in the arrangement pattern and walk away. If the 808 never existed, where you're sitting now, I don't know if I'd ever own this house, this console. Every hit record I've done has 808s in it. I've used it throughout my entire career, one way or the other. If, if not as an actual standalone 808, the sounds, because they were unlike any other. I'm assuming, you know, any, like, producer that makes rap music just has one. And so it's just part of your everyday of recording, whether, you know what I mean, like, it's just there, right? It's like, you know what I mean, it's like having jelly in your fridge. It's like you just have it all the time. Jelly? Yeah. You don't have jelly in your fridge? I have artisanal jams, though. I'm sure you do, but same yeah. thing. You get what I'm saying, right? Artisanal preserves. Yeah. Whatever, I got jelly in my fridge. It's not just the sounds that are in the 808, it's the internal rhythm of it that's so specific to that instrument, almost like the way a certain percussion player plays something. As a musician, if you have a guitarist, you have a drum, it's, it's how you interact with that machine to create the nuances that become your trademark. And the trademark of, of an 808 is that human interaction. Actually, a really nice feature of the 808 was you have this huge tempo knob and then you have this smaller, like, kind of fine tuning, which you can kind of play with and, and slip and slide the, the, the rhythm and the tempo. And these are all things that, you know, make 808 based tracks so incredibly wonderful. And, and, and again, there's a spirit, there's, a, there's, a, there's an energy there from that machine. What happened in the early 80s, like, the way that that, that staple became the, the sort of heartbeat of dance music, that's, that's the starting point for where we are now, you know? If it weren't for those records, I don't think the 808 would carry on because of what a great sound it is. In some ways, the idea that it was obsolete 18 months after was true. You know, it really was. But because it was used on these great records, it has such a signature sound, it lives on forever. Every musical movement actually comes from technology. Because there's only so many chord progression, there's only you know, so many notes. What makes a difference is when there's a new instrument that is created and people are like, okay, I'm gonna use it, I'm gonna twist it. I think it happened big time with the 808. I guess the interesting thing for me would be to be able to see what Roland thinks of what they've created or they even understand the culture that they created. They, they had created a whole underlying musical movement you know, a few the, musical the, the, the movements. movements. That's yeah. the thing. There's been a few of them. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be really interesting to me to hear what they think about the 808 and, and the music that's been created from it. I have a feeling they have no idea. Nah, I don't think so. <laughs> we bring the beats that make you vibrate. We bring the beats that make you vibrate. I graduated a mechanical course of a technical school. But my hobby, uh, of course, music and uh, uh, electronics, that's background, not uh, <laughs> in the school I study how to make an you know, uh, operate racer or milling machine. No, not <laughs> no electronics. Then they look at uh, manufacturer. Ah, uh, Steinway, Yamaha, Kawai, all big company. No room for me. Only electronics have chance. Then I start to electronics musical instrument. No, this is the beginning of uh, Ace. Then uh, 13 years later, I start Roland. No, then uh, many organ company, 
uh, understand home organ need to do section. So future, I want to develop organ. Then already we can build into this machine to organ, no? Then people ask, ah, can you program? Then I start to 78, no? So this is uh, one of, no, another step. In that time, I have a many cap, no? Sometime engineer, sometime uh, sales manager, sometime production manager. So I change head, no cap. <laughs> so it's a small company. Of course, first target is real, no, uh, conga, real thumb, real base, no? But not so easy to simulate, no? Only I can catch character, no, of a sound. Never reach the real drum sound. But uh, in that time, memory very expensive. So by memory, not so easy. So we have to use another no, generator, uh, very special generator, combination of this generator. Then I create no sound. Any electronic circuit, just before a uh, critical point, then they give electron shock. Then uh, electronically, they start no vibration. I use this, no? I use no defect transistor. Uh, in that time, uh, they make uh, 10,000 no, uh, transistor, probably 2%, 3% defect. This defect transistor making noise, rejected, no? Good one for sale, bad one throw away. I purchased this, no, defect transistor. This is a, no, sizzling sound, no, source. Semiconductor technology, better and better. Finally, defect transistor we cannot buy. <laughs> So, no way to come back.
808 snare drum, 808 clap, got an 808 this and an 808 that, got an 808 boom and an 808 back. Boom. Oh. 